All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Nishinjo Yadav uh, from USC, and today the title of my talk is Harnessing AI to Raise Awareness About HIV <coughs> Amongst Homeless Youth. This is joint work between Millen's Group at USC and Eric's Group at the USC School of Social Work. So, as you all know, HIV is a very dangerous disease. Every year, almost 2.5 million new people get infected with HIV, and it results in 1.7 million deaths. It's an even bigger problem amongst homeless youth, as almost 3 to 10 percent of homeless people are HIV positive. And this is 10 times the rate of infection in the general population. Specifically, Los Angeles, where we are based, uh, is home to one of the largest homeless populations in the country, with over 45,000 homeless people in, in LA County itself. And over the past four years, we've been working with homeless shelters in Los Angeles to raise awareness about HIV amongst homeless youth. So the question that we want to answer is, how can we use AI to tackle this problem that homeless, uh, you know, to reduce or to spread awareness about HIV? Now, traditionally, these homeless shelters, they organize intervention programs for these youth where they select a small set of homeless youth and they train them as peer leaders, where these peer leaders are taught about how does the HIV virus spread, what can you do to prevent yourself from getting the virus, what do you do if you think you have the virus, and so on and so forth. More importantly, these peer leaders are then encouraged to spread these messages, this information that they've just received, amongst their peers in their social circles. Now, this is important, this encouragement to spread messages is important because homeless youth, just like us, are connected in one big social network. For example, this is the friendship-based social network of homeless youth uh, who visited my friend's place, which is another homeless shelter in Los Angeles, uh, over some period. Every number that you see here is a homeless person, uh, a homeless youth rather, and the edges between the numbers represents friendships between the youth. Uh, the problem statement, uh, the, the, our problem statement that we would like to tackle is, given a social network such as this as input, our goal is to come up with a sequential adaptive plan or a policy for picking M subsets of nodes, where M is the number of interventions that the shelter wants to organize. And for each intervention, we want to select a subset of N nodes from the social network, so that we select N homeless youth and train them, them as peer leaders in every intervention. We want to pick these peer leaders over all these M interventions in a way which maximizes the expected number of influence nodes in the social network. We want to maximize the number of people who get this information about HIV in the social network at the end of these interventions. Okay, uh, so the solution that we propose is that we build AI-based software agents on a very high level. Uh, our agents have two different components. There's a network application which interacts with homeless youth and constructs a social network that connects these youth. This network is then fed into our algorithms that run inside the agents. They are the workhorse inside our agents. This algorithm then comes up with the recommendation of which homeless youth should be selected as intervention attendees, which youth should be selected as peer leaders. The shelter official then conducts the intervention and then provides more information about friendships that he may have ascertained in the, in the social network. Uh, and it provides us as feedback to the algorithm, which then this thing goes around in a loop. It then further recommends more intervention attendees, gets more feedback, and so on and so forth. Now, for this algorithm, we de developed two different kinds of algorithms, Healer and Dosim. Uh, due to lack of time, I won't have time, into, time to go into the details of these algorithms. But on a very high level, Healer was the first algorithm that we developed. Uh, it casts this entire problem as a partially observable Markov decision process. Uh, and basically, in order to scale up the solution of the POMDP, it relies on the fact that real-world social networks have a lot of community structure. So it utilizes this community structure to partition the network into different communities, and then it solves an in independent POMDP on each community. Right? Uh, so that was a f that's the first algorithm on a very high level. DOSIM, it handles adaptivity via a, sing a very simple greedy policy. Uh, it solves a more general problem than, than Healer. So Healer assumes that propagation probabilities, which are used in the, in, uh, in the diffusion spread models, these probabilities have to be provided as input to the problem. Uh, DOSIM can work even without these probabilities. It assumes that all you need to give it is a, a range over which these probabilities lie in, and it can work with that. Okay, uh, so that's a very hi high level overview. Uh, I will now talk about the evaluation, uh, which is what I want to talk about. Uh, so we conducted three pilot studies to test out our algorithms in the real world. Uh, we tested uh, amongst 173 homeless youth in Los Angeles. Uh, we collected results from these pilot studies we, and we analyzed why is it that simple algorithms fail and why is it that our AI-based solutions are working very well. Mind you, these are the first studies which compare algorithms for influence maximization in the real world. 
so the setup is that for in each pilot study, we will try out a different method of selecting peer leaders. In the first pilot study, we'll use Healer. In the second pilot study, we'll use DOSIM. And in the third pilot study, we will use degree centrality, which is basically you select the most popular people in the social network as peer leaders, the one who have the most number of friends. Uh, we use this as a baseline because this is what homeless shelters are doing right now. That this, is, this is the strategy that they use currently to select peer leaders. And in each pilot study, we go to a homeless shelter and we recruit approximately 60 homeless youth. We construct the social network between them. And then we conduct three interventions. And in each intervention, we will select four peer leaders uh, using our different algorithms. Okay. As, as an example, for the first pilot study, we went to Safe Place for Youth. This is a shelter in Venice Beach. We go to the shelter, we recruit 60 homeless youth, and this is the social network that we were able to construct using a network applications. So uh, this is a social network. Healer, our first algorithm, looks at the social network and comes up with the recommendation of these four nodes that should be selected as peer leaders. Uh, it then gets further information about the social network. In the second intervention, it comes up with another set of four nodes that, su that should be selected. And then similar things happen in the third round. Now, in this picture, there are two different kinds of nodes. There are the black nodes, which are the peer leaders whom we directly give information to. And then there are the remaining nodes, which we call non-peer leaders, whom we did not give uh, direct information to, whom we hope information would reach. Now, what we would like to measure is what percentage of the non-peer leaders got information about HIV, uh, since you know that would be the true metric of how well our algorithms are performing. And that is what we measure. So in this figure, the y-axis is showing what percentage of the non-peer leaders were informed about HIV by the end of these interventions. The x-axis is the three different pilot studies. As you can see, uh, Healer and Dosim were able to spread information to 70% of the non-peer leaders, whereas Degree Centrality was only able to spread information to 27% of the non-peer leaders. So our AI-based methods are, are doing well in terms of spreading information. Now, is this information spread actually resulting in any behavior change? So that's what we measure next. So of these people in the blue who got this information about HIV, we want to measure what percentage of these informed people actually started getting tested for HIV by the end of this, these interventions. So this is measuring what percentage of the informed people started getting tested for HIV, and the, the people who got tested for HIV are the people in the green. In the AI-based uh, pilot studies, uh, approximately 40% and I think 30, 27% of the people who were informed about HIV had started getting tested for HIV, whereas in degree centrality, nobody, none of the in informed non-peer leaders had started getting tested for HIV. So why is degree centrality performing so poorly? Uh, we were able to figure out a couple of reasons. The first is that the real-world social networks that we had collected in the pilot studies, and more generally, many real-world social networks have a lot of community structure. This is one of the social networks that we collected for our, for our pilot studies. This figure is showing that for all the three networks that we collected, if you partition the networks into different communities and you figure out how many edges are going across these communities, uh, this is what we're measuring in this figure. What percentage of edges go across communities when you partition them into different communities? And across all uh, three networks, approximately 12% of the edges go across communities, which means they're fairly clustered. Now, since these communities represent cliques of friends, uh, what invariably happens is most of these people know everybody else in the community, right? And so therefore, nodes within a community will have similar degrees. Now, as a result of this, what degree centrality ends up doing is that it focuses all of its efforts on just a, a single community or a couple of community, uh, completely ignoring other communities, uh, thereby resulting in lesser influence spread. Uh, whereas our AI-based algorithms are able to diversify their efforts across different communities, thereby getting more influence spread. This intuition is verified uh, by this figure, where we are seeing that Healer and Dosim, our AI-based methods, are able to diversify their e efforts across all different communities, whereas degree centrality gets uh, is completely ignores several, several communities. So this is the first reason. There's yet another reason that when you pick nodes in a social network, uh, when you pick these peer leaders, there are going to be some edges that go across these peer leaders. Now, from an influence maximization standpoint, these edges are redundant because influence spread along these edges does not matter. Both the endpoints are already influenced. Now, as you can see, when we collected data from the pilot studies, we saw that degree centrality created 21% 20, of the edges as redundant. That means one-fifth of the edges in the social network are no longer useful. 
uh, which is why degree centrality is performing poorly, whereas Healer and Dosim created less than half this number. So to summarize, uh, degree centrality fails to exploit community structure, and it generates lots of redundant edges, which is why it performs poorly. And there are some other reasons that we've outlined in the paper. Uh, so this is it. Uh, so to summarize, uh, we conducted, we developed AI-based algorithms uh, to spread awareness about HIV amongst homeless youth, and we can we tested them in the field with actual homeless youth, and we saw that they're performing much better than what is currently happening, the current modus operandi, which is degree centrality. Uh, we are starting a much larger study with 900 homeless youth, uh, and that's it. Thank you. How do you account for the, the spread of misinformation along with information? This could be a bigger problem than uh, information passing from... Uh, what would misinformation... Uh, for example, the, the efficacy of treatments or that, you know, especially in a culture like India where there's a lot of uh, connotation from um, cultural grounds, mm -hmm. uh, the, the spread of misinformation can have a larger uh, uh, impact negatively than the spread of information itself. So we have done, I mean, I haven't done, but I mean, there's been work in my research group that has looked at competing influence. Uh, so there are two parties who are trying to spread compete competing influences in a social network. Uh, I yeah, I think so. For example, in I think in the drug, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, when when uh, so in the in the drug prevention problem, when when people are trying to when you're trying to spread messages about you know you shouldn't be doing drugs, there is the drug peddlers who want to spread in, uh, uh, information about you know you should be doing drugs. So there are two competing influences, and yeah, that that becomes sort of a game theoretic problem. So it's, uh, yeah, to answer your question, that's a different line of work, which is slightly different, but people in my group have done work with that.